Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. I really want to give a warm welcome to Dr. Terry Walls, who is bringing us major breakthrough information and expertise. She is the author of Minding My Mitochondria, How I Overcame Secondary Progressive Multiple Sclerosis and Got Out of My Wheelchair. You've got to get this book. It's remarkable. Another book she wrote is Food and Brain Health, Lectures and Supplemental Materials. Dr. Walls is a professor of medicine at the University of Iowa. She did an 18-minute talk on TED in Iowa City that's had over 250,000 views. She has an array of tape lectures that she's done. She has a foundation and is doing clinical trials. You should also know she's working on her new book called Up From the Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Terry Walls. Welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. Thank you. The way that you're navigating the introduction of the material and your life experience is one with tremendous calm, but also clear conviction about how we have to feed our brain and our mitochondria. Now, people have in the past, with great expertise, talked about the mitochondria and taking supplements and eating good food and having more vegetables. There's been books out on the paleo diet and hunter and gathers, but there's something about the way in which you're synthesizing so many pieces of a very complex spectrum that's exciting. Talk to us about why our mitochondria is so important, and in particular, your take on what we need to be doing with our mitochondria and our brain. In our cells, all of our cells, is a tiny subunit called the mitochondria. And that mitochondria manages the power that all of our cells use to drive the chemistry of life. If our mitochondria are very effective then that cell will be very effective. If the mitochondria are struggling, then that cell will struggle. You know, when I had my MS and I hit the wheelchair, I went back to reading the literature because I knew basic science discoveries uh, can be 10, 20, 30 years ahead of uh, clinical practice. Uh, and so I was hoping I could find things that would slow down my descent into deepening disabilities. And as I was reading about problems in which uh, brains were shrinking, uh, such as MS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Huntington's disease, I saw that in all of them, mitochondria were not working very well. Uh, and the mitochondria would send a signal to the cell, uh, and in this case, the brain cell, to die too early. Uh, based on that, I then started researching what we could do to improve the effectiveness of the cells. Uh, and at first, I started looking for the, lewis, the latest, newest drug basic science research. Then it occurred to me that that was silly because I couldn't access those things. But if I uh, started looking for vitamins and supplements to support mitochondria, those were the things that I could take. Uh, so back in 2003, 2004, I learned that things like B vitamins, coenzyme Q, creatine, uh, and antioxidants, were, uh, plus sulfur, were all very, very helpful to mitochondria. And I started taking those. Uh, and what I found was that it, it slowed down my descent. If I uh, stopped them, uh, I was profoundly exhausted and could not get out of bed. So... Uh, I uh, certainly tuned in to uh, reading more, understanding more about the mitochondria, and that that was very important for the brain. Uh, I, I now see that the mitochondria and the health of our mitochondria are critical for problems related to the heart, uh, to the kidneys, to the liver, uh, to the pancreas, and to uh, basically all of our brain disorders. Uh, so in my clinical practice, I spend a fair amount of time teaching my patients that they have to eat uh, specifically to improve their mitochondria, and that will improve the function of whatever uh, cells or organs that are have been compromised by their illness. I have a question as an MD. How do you look at the health of your patient's mitochondria? What are you looking at exactly? Basically, 
actually, I'm looking at the person's health overall. So problems with headaches and fatigue are uh, big clues that mitochondria are impaired. Problem with heart, heart failure, that's another big clue that mitochondria are impaired. Uh, there's evidence uh, yeah, people with diabetes or with liver problems uh, have difficulty with uh, uh, mitochondria as well. You know, when we look at uh, the basic science of uh, understanding the chemistry behind all of our disease states, uh, what we're discovering is that it's a very common pathway. All of our chronic diseases have at the root of the disease broken biochemistry, too much inflammation, and mitochondria that don't work well. Uh, And so I've shifted my focus clinically to helping people uh, use diet to address those problems, the uh, too much inflammation and mitochondria that don't work well. You're doing really what Hippocrates would do. You kind of remind me of the female version of a modern-day Hippocrates. You're saying food is medicine or food as medicine. Food is the medicine. There you go. Drugs may control symptoms. They can go after one step in the biochemical process. But by understanding uh, food, understanding uh, cellular biology more effectively now, I understand that the real solution to most of these problems is teaching people how to eat so they're providing their mitochondria and their cells the building blocks that are needed to do the chemistry of life properly. What do you say to people who say, listen, doctor, we know that our soils are so depleted in nutrients. How could we possibly expect what we might have expected thousands or hundreds and thousands and millions of years ago in terms of the food quality? What do you say to that? I certainly acknowledge that uh, there are some interesting studies that have shown the mineral content of our food steadily declined, as has some of the vitamin content. My advice is find a local farmer who uses a sustainable growing practice, certainly organic, and get your food locally. I also am now partnering with Backyard Abundance to teach people how easy it is to incorporate an edible landscape and begin growing your own food or creating sprouts in your house garden, so to speak. I think health comes with greater food independence. Greater food independence comes with buying locally from sustainably grown farmers and growing your own food. I think that's great. I know that many of us are so attracted to Trader Joe's and to Whole Foods and I certainly love going in there, but the scary thing on the vegetable area of these markets, and they're different, but a lot of the vegetables come from other locations around the world. It's not local. Yes, yes. And foods grown outside of the U.S., I think we have to have some concern over the quality, the rigor of the organic label. You know, and we have to have uh, concerns here as well over the rigor of the organic label. I like to spend my money in the community. I really like to buy uh, my meats locally, my produce uh, locally as well as I can, and growing it. I've become sensitive to concerns about cost and how to make this more uh, sustainable and doable. Uh, That's part of why I've been partnering with our master gardeners to develop some programs to teach people how to begin growing their own That's food. fantastic. I love what you're talking about. On a whole systems level, this is really the way to go. You know, when I hear the conversations about health care reform and the exploding health care costs, no one is talking about the root cause of why health care costs are out of control. We're eating all this white sugar, white flour, high fructose corn syrup. We're not eating vegetables. We're starving ourselves. And until we fix that, health care costs will explode no matter what the government does, worker productivity will decline and we will basically be destroying our future. That's right. I was delighted to see that you were following Dr. Weston Price and his contributions. I've even utilized his discoveries about dental work in the last few months of my life. (laughs) I had a tooth that reabsorbed and did not pay for and get a root canal and actually had it extracted and another tooth put in. Can you share with the audience about the blood-brain barrier? Because certain things pass through it, certain things don't, and I think we need to establish a frame of reference for the public. 
I'm going to talk about two barriers here. There's the brain-blood barrier, and then there's the gut 